So Mark, we Thanks. understand that there are really sort of two types of companies, right? I mean, we've heard this, those that have been hacked and those that don't know that they've been hacked. So what, pretty accurate. What, what is this all about? I mean, what are, what are hackers really after? I mean, we, we know that this is, this is a key focus of CEOs. We continue to hear that, that cybersecurity and security is on top of mind of the CEOs, but what are the hackers really after? Is it? Well, I think, uh, you know, the, and I'm gonna talk about this in a few minutes a little bit, but there, certainly the IT is a big, um, for certain types of actors, the, the intellectual property of companies is a key target. Um, we're seeing products come to the market now from other countries that many of you have probably spent decades um, developing that they're able to take to market in 12 months um, with no uh, development costs associated. So that's a big deal. Certainly the cyber crime piece, you know, it's all about the money. Um, and I'm, I'll talk about one other thing uh, in my talk in a few minutes. Um, ransomware uh, is probably one of the, I think one of the greatest threats that each of us face um, today. But overall, I mean, this is a, the, the, um, the technology is moving so fast today um, that our companies and our nations, our governments cannot keep up with it, can't keep up with the, um, the threats and vulnerabilities associated with that technology. So it's, a, uh, it's an interesting space to be in right now. It's very, very dynamic. And uh, uh, if you're in the security business, those of you that are in the security business, you know that uh, job security is very good these days. Well, I think we're all in the security business. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, Mark. You. Thank all you. Right. I have one. We'll see if mine works. Um, well, thank you for having me here today. You know, I, I do a lot of conferences and, and talks in different places. And one of my measures um, is the cover music. So the cover music here has been awesome so far. So it's like, this is one of my, on the, uh, on the high scale of, of good conferences so far. Um, as was mentioned, I was the, I wasn't the, Deputy Secretary, I was the Deputy Undersecretary. The, there's a hierarchy in government that's like, be, I was like, I was in the government for, for probably 60 days before I figured the hierarchy out. You know, is an under above a assistant or is it below a deputy and it's, it's all over the map and anyway. But I was responsible for um, security for all of the federal government agencies and the 16 critical infrastructure sectors as defined by uh, Presidential Decision Directive 63, which uh, President Clinton signed way back in 1998. Um, the chemical sector is one of the sectors that I was uh, worked very closely with, U different user groups, uh, the Chemical uh, Information Sharing and Analysis Center. Uh, anybody associated with the ISAC, the Chem ISAC? Nobody? That would explain one thing. I went to the Chem ISAC website yesterday and they have a, um, it looks like the latest document was 2012 that was put up there. Um, so, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. But, uh, so I'm gonna talk about a variety of things today. As a matter of fact, Tom wanted me to kind of hit on a couple things, but in a 45 minute window, there's only so much you can cram in there. So I'm gonna kind of skim across the surface, but talk about a bunch of different things, starting with the, the threat and vulnerability landscape. So <clears throat> I tell people this all the time, don't take it personally when you get hacked because the bad guys are not taking it personally. You're simply a commodity to them. Your data is a commodity to them. Your company is a commodity to them. You're a resource, something that they can go after. They, they do not put a face to the product. They're just after your data, after your information. And, um, and when you do take it personally is when people start getting in trouble because then you want to respond personally. And when you respond to some of these guys, it's the worst thing in the world that you can do. You know, one of the big conversations in, in the government over the last couple of years is, and in the private sector, but in the government has been leading it, is about hacking back. Um, and hacking back is a bad idea in my mind. Um, and I get in very uh, intense debate with some of my colleagues about that. But my view of hacking back is, you know, you're punching at somebody that you don't know how big that person on the other side is. It could be a nation state or it could be a, an individual hacker. 
So you really, there's a lot of un unintended consequences when you go start going down that road. Here's the bad news. Um, I could put a um, hundred or so of these different hacker groups and nation state groups down here. And as I say up there, in no other area of our world are private companies expected to do battle with these kinds of organizations. And these organizations are after you every single day. And I want to apologize up front. This is not going to be a happy speech. Um, it, 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 sometimes people run out of the room weeping. Um, but I'm going to end on a high note, I hope. Uh, but I do want to kind of set the landscape. This is a, it's a tough business that we're in today. And every one of your individual companies is facing these threats every single day. Um, some of you know it, some of you don't. As Scott said earlier, there are two types of companies, those that have been hacked and those that don't know they've been hacked. Um, and that's changing a little bit. One of the other things he said, um, I've talked to, I've been invited to talk to 13 boards in the last 12 months. And boards of directors finally, finally, after years and years, um, are starting to say, you know what, this is something we need to be paying attention to at the board level. This is something, how many CISOs out here in the audience? Or CSOs? None? I could lie about anything and you guys wouldn't know? All right. Um, but CISOs really have been kind of the voice in the wilderness for, for decades. Um, but now, quite frankly, we have more attention than we know what to do with, um, which can be good and bad. The budgets are great, but expectations are also very high right now. Um, so the point here is that um, you really are, you're doing battle. There are some very fundamental things that companies can do to decrease the risk and lower the threshold, but, um, but there's a lot of work to do for every one of us, uh, because we said earlier, it's a very dynamic environment. The things that I worry about today are not the things that I'm gonna worry about tomorrow. So here we are, we're surrounded by threats. We have nation states, I kind of divide these in, in, in between uh, from outside the organization and from within the organization. Outside are the ones that we hear about every day. You know, these are the ones that are on the, in the newspaper and in the media every day. Uh, the supply chain issue is one that I think um, is getting a lot more credibility in, in these days, and that is the reason because we all buy products from someplace else, and we don't necessarily know where, all the, where those products come from, and we don't know what is embedded in those project, products. And when you think of an espionage uh, component, um, this is a big deal. We know that uh, there are certain countries um, that are hijacking products and embedding their own technology as part of the supply chain. So when you get something, it may not be what came out of the factory. Um, we know that there are countries that have compromised the, um, the component processing. So when, a, when an integrated circuit is being developed, it may have um, software uh, embedded in it that the uh, the company didn't originally intend it for. And that's ending up in all of our products. And for, for you guys, um, in the industrial control system space, that is very, very concerning, I think, to a lot of people. On the other side, on the in, from within, the disengaged boards, as I said, that is changing, uh, not rapidly enough, but it is changing. Uh, poor cyber hygiene continues to be a problem. And this is something that I think we in the security community, certainly we in the vendor security community have failed at because we make it too hard for the common everyday user to do security. Um, you know, if you think, again, if any other aspect of your life, if you had to patch your car every month, if you had to, to, to download new software so your car would run every month, we'd probably think that that was not a good idea. Um, and, you know, you extrapolate that across all the different areas of your life, and it's, you can see where it's very easy that um, you would be out of date very quickly. Um, and that's the real problem with security. That's the problem with technology is that we have to continuously update things that, um, that takes a lot of time. It costs a lot of money, and that's why most organizations are behind the curve on that. So here are some of the actors, and you know, I am, uh, 
I'm using country names here to make a point, and these are, these are pr nothing that, um, that you haven't read about. But when I was in the government, these are the things that, that absolutely concerned me a lot, was certain of these nation states and certain of these groups that were focusing on very specific things. Cyber espionage, uh, as my friend General Hayden says, I stand in awe of the Chinese and what they've been able to do. Um, they're very, very good at it. Um, and they are rummaging around in every one of your companies today, um, probably. Uh, <clears throat> cyber crime, again, motivated purely by the dollar. How can we steal something and turn it into dollars? Usually it's personal information, credit card information, things like that. But we are seeing some of the nation state former espionage actors being able to um, getting into the crime market now where they steal intellectual property that then they can sell to other nation state organizations. And finally, down at the bottom, these are the hacktivism and, terror and cyber terrorism. These are the groups that concern me the most. In the espionage and crime game, there is there are unwritten rules of the road. I mean, in espionage, for, you know, espionage has been around forever. Um, technology has just given it a bigger footprint. But there are kind of norms of behavior, and, and people know that if you do step too far outside the swim lanes, somebody's going to slap your hand. In the hacktivism group, they really don't care about that, and that really scares me a lot. Um, I was the chief security officer for the North American Electric Reliability Corporation for a few years. So I worked with all of the electric utilities in North America, uh, helping them with their cybersecurity, mostly on the compliance side, but really on the security side as well. And I was on the job for seven days when Stuxnet happened. And for those of you that know Stuxnet, um, Stuxnet was a, 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 a a problem for their Iranians. Um, but what happened there was it was a, a technical problem that caused physical damage. And when you think about the industrial control system space, certainly in your own organization, that's the thing that scares the government. That sc should scare everybody in the room. Uh, when I can take a piece of software or I can um, inject uh, malicious code into something and, and make a machine do something it's not supposed to do. Um, so that's, and, and these guys down here, they really don't care about the unintended consequences of things. They, I mean, um, they, you know, global th thermonuclear war would mean nothing to these people if they had the capacity to do it. And quite frankly, they are getting the capacity. You know, five or six years ago, Iran was not on the target list of any nation in the world from a cyber perspective. Very, very quickly over the last five years, have they have developed the skill and capability, and so they are a player now on the, uh, on the national stage. And then we have the insider threat. Um, and we talk about it all the time. We talk about the, you know, the insider problem, but more than half of all security incidents that we have in our companies today are the result of an act of somebody inside our company. Not, perhaps not malicious, but perhaps naive or ignorant. But, and, and that goes to the, to the whole component of, of cybersecurity training and education of our employees. But when you think about half of the, the I go back to what I said earlier, we make it, we have, as a security community have failed because users are able to do things that impact our company. They shouldn't have, they shouldn't be able to do that. And I'm going to talk a little bit more uh, in, in a few minutes uh, about what we can be doing about that. So this is from a report. Some of you may know um, Eyesight Partners. They're a um, threat intelligence company. And they don't pay me anything to say this, but I just really like them a lot. Um, they were actually just recently acquired by FireEye. Uh, but Eyesight, they put out, I, I get a daily in threat intelligence report from them. Um, and a couple of months ago, they, they had this report, and it, um, and it highlighted these, the uh, cyber espionage and hacktivism. But these are some of the different hacker groups and some of the, the uh, 
areas that they focus on, some of the sectors that they're focused on. Kim is not up here. I don't think that means that Kim is not facing a threat. Um, they probably just didn't have any uh, significant activity there. But you can see some of these groups, they focus very specifically on certain sectors. Um, this uh, koala team focused on the manufacturing sector, energy and, hack and healthcare. Um, but to focus on these different areas means you have to cultivate and develop very specific expertise to target those different sectors. And this tells you, the, 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 the important piece about this, is it tells you how focused and how, how um, important it is to get certain skills in certain areas that you're able to say, this is our area of expertise. So what is the role of government? People ask me this a lot because they want to know, well, what's the government thinking? And I'll tell you, um, I have sat in the White House sit room a number of times when there's an event happening, and we look around at each other, and we didn't want to say it, but it's like, what the heck do we do here? Um, how does the government get involved? Um, I thought it was significant last December in 2014 when Sony was hacked, and um, eight days later, President Obama came out and said it was North Korea. They gave attribution to North Korea almost immediately. And um, that was unprecedented, um, absolutely unprecedented for the president to come out and say something like that. Um, but the point here is that this is a, it's a, a tough business, and knowing um, what's the appropriate level of response is an incredible challenge. You know, for the, the, so the president came out and made a statement about Sony, but there are a thousand different events affecting companies every day, and we don't get that kind of response from the, from the federal government, or even from a state government, or even from the regulator in many cases. So that's where the government is struggling, is what's the appropriate level of response? Do we go to North Korea and apply more sanctions? In Sony, maybe that was the case. But if North Korea hacked your company, would, what would be the government's response there? And I, I don't know the answer to it. I'm not sure anybody, there's no, uh, there's no doctrine that says if a uh, crime meets a certain threshold, you know, we do this. If it meets another threshold, we do this. I think it's very situational right now, which is a problem. But again, I think it speaks to the dynamic nature of the problem of the space that we're in today. I spent far more time on Capitol Hill than I ever intended to. And I'm a cybersecurity guy. Um, I cannot tell you how many times I sit across the table from someone half my age telling me, well, this is the way you're going to do things. And uh, when they had absolutely no idea what they were talking about. Um, that's not a criticism. That's a little bit of a criticism. Um, but the point is that there are 22 pieces of legislation on the floor today, and some, n none, of them, none of these here have had a hearing, but there are 22 pieces of legislation right here that are, have in some shape or form uh, cybersecurity or privacy attached to them. As a private sector guy now, this, this concerns me. I gave a speech in D.C. a few months ago, and I, I, I had a slide similar to this up, and I said, this is one of the greatest risks facing the private sector today, regulation by the government. And there were a couple legislators in the room, and they took exception with what I said um, and, and told me about it later on. Um, but this is something that, that the private industry needs to be thinking about. There are a lot of, lot of uh, legis pieces of legislation working their way through the process that could end up being um, regulation for you at some point down the road. Um, for those of you that are fortunate or unfortunate enough to have lobbyists on the Hill, you probably are already aware of this. A lot of people do not know this and do not know the level of activity that's going on. Now, the good news, or again, maybe not so good news, um, how about these, uh, this presidential race, huh? Talk about a goat rope. Um, so the good news is there's probably nothing going to happen here uh, with these different pieces of legislation because most of them are distracted with, uh, with some other things right now. 
So I'm going to spend a little bit of time here. There, there are a lot of trends. There are a lot of things going on in the cyber world. But these are two of the biggest things that really kind of hit and stayed on the, the, the front burner last year. The first one is ransomware. Um, and I'm going to make the assumption that there's somebody in this room that does not know what ransomware is. Um, ransomware simply is malicious code or malware that gets into your environment. And once a hacker gets in, embeds this, uh, this malware into your environment, they're able to encrypt all of your data, all of the data in an entire company. Um, encrypt it so that you can't access it, you can't read it. And then what you do is you get a, you get a pop-up on your computer screen that says, all of your important files are encrypted. Go to this website, send us $500, and we'll send you the encryption key to unlock your data. This, was, this is not new. Um, uh, ransomware, actually, we were starting to see ransomware four, three or four years ago. But last year, it became, and this year, it became a big deal. There's been several big cases of it, of it so far this year. Um, so <clears throat> I call this a gut-wrenching decision time for a CEO. Do you pay the ransom, or do you thumb your nose at them? Well, there have been a, several cases where you said, the CEO said, I'm not paying it. Do whatever you want to do. I'm not paying it. And then the bad guy goes, click. And deletes all of your data. So you're, you're in business, all of your customer information is gone, all of your accounts receivable information is gone, um, all of your intellectual property in digital form is gone, your entire company is gone. Well, companies now are saying, okay, maybe I should pay this. Uh, it's typically a small enough amount that most companies, um, they, I mean, they can write a check. It's usually three to $500. I mean, it's, it's trivial, it's in, insignificant. Um, there was an event, you probably saw it in, in January, uh, Hollywood Presbyterian Hospital in, in LA um, was a victim and they said, we're not paying. Um, and they had to move all the patients out of the hospital. They, they basically, the hospital shut down. Uh, they went back to pencil and paper uh, for about eight days, and they finally said, fortunately, the, the bad guys did not delete everything. Um, and they finally paid the ransom. The, the ransom, by the way, had gone up. They ended up paying, I think, $17,000. But $17,000 is, 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 is insignificant for a company like that. But I, I only bring this up because there, one of you in this room this year is highly likely to be faced with ransomware. You need to think about this before, you ha before it happens. So what's the solution for this? The solution is back up your data. Make sure you have a good backup of your data. And guess what? Back it up separately from your network. Because the first thing these guys do when they encrypt your data, when they get in your environment, they find your backups and they make sure that your backups are encrypted too. Take your backups, disconnect them, store them offsite, store them disconnected from your network. This is a big deal. I mean, t I, 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 a year ago, I would not have thought that I would be standing up here talking about ransomware. But it's a big dang deal right today. Um, and there are companies, there are companies that go out of business when this happens. You know, if, if, if you lose all of your data, you simply, if you're a small business, you don't have the wherewithal to recover from something like that. So the next thing is, Advanced Persistent Threat. Um, Mandiant, uh, FireEye just released their M Trends report for, for 2016. They do it every year. And um, 146 days is the average dwell time of a bad guy in a company before somebody goes, hey, there's somebody rummaging around in our network here. 146 days, that's almost five months of some guy or some group reading your data, copying your data, watching who's doing what within your environment. Makes you feel a little violated, doesn't it? But this is, I mean, this is a, 
this is a big, big deal. And they call it advanced persistent threat because it's very persistent. These guys come in, they don't break the glass and barge in through the front door. They sneak in, they're very quiet, very stealthy. I see this in my, my previous job before this, I was a, was a consultant and I would get called in um, to companies that were dealing with a problem like this and you could see that when, when a company would say, okay, we see this guy, stop it. They would immediately go dark, they would go quiet. Here's the second gut-riching decision for a CEO. When, um, when they discover an event, let me go back to this, this second piece here, 53%. 53% of all security incidents are discovered by somebody outside the company. The FBI knocks on your door and says, hey, we have indication that there's a bad guy in your environment. Or a customer calls you and says, hey, I just found all my personal data in a database on the internet and it came from you. Um, those are not calls you like to get, I promise you. Um, one, it's embarrassing that it happened and you d your, your IT staff didn't find out about it. And that is not a knock on the IT staff. This is hard stuff. So the APT is a big deal. I mean, w it, it, there are technologies out there that can detect this, but it's very, very hard stuff to do. Um, and it's, it's probably one of the biggest things that, that, um, that companies and government organizations are worried about today is this guy's in there for long periods of time without anybody recognizing that they're there. So, my top five con security concerns. There are a thousand things that I could recommend to you today. Um, and, but in, in my experience, there are a few things that make a big difference. First one is go hack yourself. Um, and what I mean by that is, Bad guys are hacking you. Why don't you hack yourself? Find out what your vulnerabilities are before the bad guys do. There are, there are, you, uh, there are organizations, companies that can do this for you, or you can train and hi or hire staff to do it yourself. But companies that actually stay in front of this problem are constantly hunting in their organization for vulnerabilities and bad guys. It's, it's, an exp it's an expense that, that it's the cost of doing business today. You need to hack yourself and figure out what, your vul what vulnerabilities do you have that are exposed to the broader world that bad guys could be taking advantage of. Do it before they do it to you. The second thing is instant response and communication. Um, this quote here, um, I, I've done a number, been called in to do a number of these mitigations after an event. And I can tell you that this quote here is the last thing the general counsel of your company wants to see the CEO saying. Um, and this was indicative to me that they did not have a plan. Um, Sony did not have a plan. When, when he says that we were so taken by surprise by the events, we didn't have a playbook or a plan at that month to go, moment to go forward. Um, there are lawyers lined up around the world that said, class action lawsuit, Sony was not prepared. Um, and the worst time, and I, I know I'm speaking to the choir here, the worst time to try to figure out what your communications or crisis communication strategy is in the middle, is in the middle of an event. Because everybody's running all around with their hair on fire and you don't have a plan to do this. Um, this is, I, I, this may be the number one thing that companies should do. Build this into your incident response plan so you have, this, you have a strategy for how to deal with one of these events when they happen. If you're a big publicly traded company, the last thing you want is somebody from, I won't name a media, but somebody from a, a, a media organization standing on the sidewalk outside your company, sticking a microphone in one of your IT guys' face and say, did you guys just have an incident and what happened? I only say, use that as an example because I've seen it happen a couple times. You got some young IT guy or gal who doesn't, who's not really well versed and, and doesn't know that they're not supposed to talk to the media and all of a sudden they start talking about things again. 
the, uh, the class action lawsuit stuff starts going up and up and up. Number three, vendor, third party, and partner due diligence. Do you know how many third party contracts you have in your company? Who is providing you materials? Who has connections to your network and your data that you don't know about? I promise you, no one in this room knows the answer to that. Um, and I only say that because, again, a lot, I did a, a couple of consulting engagements, went to, to one Fortune 100 company, and they said, we need you to help us put a plan together to figure out who all of our third-party contracts are with. I said, give me a sense. How many do you have? They said, oh, 900 to 1,000. After going and talking to all the business units in the company, they had 9,000 to 10,000. So it was an order of magnitude higher than what they thought. Um, I was telling this story to a friend of mine, and I can, I, I won't say his name, um, with a very, very large manufacturing company, and I told him that story, and he goes, that's nothing. He says, I have 80,000 documented that I know about. So each one of these organizations that can touch your network, guess what? Their disease is your disease. If they're infected with something and they touch your network, you're infected with that same kind of thing. It's like an STD kind of, I guess. That's probably not a great analogy. But, um, uh, but this is a serious problem for companies. You don't, do not know who's connecting to your network and what their hygiene is, what their cyber hygiene is within their company. What can you do about it? One, you negotiate their, the contracts up front that says, that they have to maintain a certain level of cybersecurity before they can connect to your network. Now, I know everybody's out here is going, oh my God, how would I go and redo all these contracts? Um, a bite at a time, that's how you do it. Um, but this is a, it's a big problem for companies, um, especially if you have a lot of them. Um, and then, Interdependencies, I, I love this, I didn't make this up, this is from an IEEE paper back in 2001, and I use it only because electricity, when I was in the electricity industry, is a great example. But every one of you could draw a diagram kind of like this, where your company's in the middle, but you have all these dependencies. You can't make electricity without oil or water or telecommunication or natural gas or transportation, and each one of them are dependent upon other, orga other organizations too. These are all single points of failure for your company. If you can't get water to your manufacturing facility, you can't manufacture. If you can't get fuel to run your generator, you can't manufacture. And if you don't understand what these single points of failure are, when they happen, it's hard to respond to them. It's hard to recover from them. Um, and again, most companies have these. Understanding what they are, have part of a, a disaster planning, disaster recovery strategy, so you at least know what they are, is a huge leap forward for most companies. Um, administrative access and elevated privileges. There are people in your company with administrative privileges on your network that literally can access any piece of data in your company. Most of you have heard of um, Edward Snowden, who's living peacefully in the Soviet Union today. Um, he had more access, General Hayden told me this, Edward Snowden had more access to data at NSA than the director of NSA had. Um, and that's just not data, that's intelligence information. But you have people in your company that have access to data. The first thing a, guy, a bad guy does when they compromise your network or compromise your environment is they go find who has ad, admin privileges and they make themselves an admin. They ma make another admin account in your organization. And I have long advocated that there should be a flashing alarm or a flashing light or, or an audible alarm that goes off any time a new admin account is created because they can, <clears throat> this is a silent disease. A new admin account is created that, you, that, that most organizations don't know when it happens. So it's hard to audit for that, when you're, when, one, when you're not looking for it, and two, 
when you don't know when it, you don't know when it's happening. And when somebody has admin rights, they can literally do anything. There was a case. Um, I was the chief security officer for uh, for Governor Schwarzenegger in California. Um, there was a case in San Francisco where the network administrator got mad at his boss. He changed the login passwords on every router and switch in the city and uh, county of San Francisco, and he wouldn't give the password up. Um, he ended up going to jail, and Gavin Newsom was, the, uh, was the, the mayor at the time. He sat in jail for two weeks, and finally he said, if the mayor will come to the jail and apologize to me, I will give up the password so you guys can get back into the network. It was kind of one of those, mal one of those ransomware things. The mayor finally did it. He's like, they, they, the, only, the only option was them to reset all the routers and switches in the, in the entire city government, which was like a profound undertaking. So, um, so the mayor went to city jail, got his hands and knees and said, I'm sorry. And the guy gave him the password. Um, the last thing I recommend companies do is conduct a ri enterprise risk assessment. I've done dozens of these for companies and they're the most eye-opening, enlightening thing for a company that I've ever seen. Um, because even within a business unit in an organization, they may have good security and think they understand what their dependencies are. But when you go and you do an enterprise-wide risk assessment and you start seeing the relationships between the different, different business units and different organizations, all of a sudden you realize that there are dependencies that you weren't aware of. And this enterprise risk assessment really kind of highlights all of the, the no kidding things that the, the no kidding risks that an organization needs to be thinking about, needs to be concerned about. And it kind of drives a strategy out as a result of, a, of an enterprise risk assessment. So I'm gonna try to end on a little bit of a higher note here. Um, four things that make me optimistic, the internet of things, security converges, 20 security controls in the cloud. So the Internet of Things, everybody's heard of the Internet of Things. If you haven't, it's this thing out there that means everything is connected. Um, my Fitbit is connected to my iPhone. My iPhone's connected to the cloud. Um, everything is connected. Cows and sheep and, agri and, and, and um, you know, farm animals have uh, chips embedded in them so the farmer and rancher knows where they are how much weight they're gaining, when they're going to market, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. The industrial internet of things is GE's moniker, moniker for the same thing that says basically <coughs> devices that they're manufacturing, devices in the industrial world have sensors embedded in them. So things like when, when a airplane lands, um, the maintenance guys run out and they know that the light bulb in seat 3A is burned out because a sensor on the plane told them that while it was in flight or that, you know, left engine has a wobble in something. So there, there are sensors embedded in everything and all these things are talking, they're generating data. Um, that's a little scary, but the Internet of Things is actually going to, I think, make... Um, give us more visibility into what's going on. There are some significant risks with the Internet of Things. Um, the fact that these things are all generating data all the time um, is scary, and there's not enough security being built into it today. But I really think the Internet of Things is going to be a catalyst for better security. And I love this quote from John Chambers. The Internet of Things will be five to ten times more impactful in the next decade than the entire Internet has been to date. When you think about the impact that the internet has had on our lives in the past 20 years, I mean, uh, it, that's been profound. And when you, when, if the internet of things is five to 10 times more impactful than what the internet has been, that makes my head want to explode because that's a big, big impact on us. Um, convergence. We talked about security convergence. I remember this, co this conversation first came up about 12, 13 years ago we started talking about, let's bring our different pieces of security organizations together, bring the physical security guys together with the IT security guys. 
and it kind of got a little bit of a movement, but it never really got off the ground. For the last couple of years, convergence has become the big thing. And now we've realized that there's great value in bringing together IT, physical security, and ICS data, ICS security together. Something that happens in the IT world that um, may actually impact somebody in the ICS world or in the physical security world. Um, and uh, y there's, a, there's many, many examples of this, of, of the value of something like this. One of them, um, we had a, a case a couple of years ago where we had a, in the electricity business, one of the, one of the utilities I was working with had a substation that had been broken into, a remote substation. There are, most people know this, so there are 45,000 substations scattered across the United States. Um, and many of them are very remote locations. Well, this substation had been broken into three or four times over 12 months. They would go out, the gate on the fence had been, uh, the lock had been uh, broken off, the doorknob had been broken off of the substation, and nothing was wrong. They would get, go out there, and as my friend Jasper Gill likes to say, they didn't know if they needed to send um, a guy with a wrench or a guy with a gun. Um, but they would get out there, and they couldn't find anything wrong. Fast forward a year, they realized that somebody was getting into that substation, they were m manipulating the PLCs uh, to do things that they weren't supposed to. So, so there, were, there was a physical action resulting in an electronic problem. And they didn't know that because they didn't have visibility. The, the physical security guys, they would go out there and they would fix the door and they would fix the gate and they would go home. But there was actually another problem there that they weren't aware of. And, you know, I don't, and again, I, uh, I, I don't normally call out vendors, but Alert Enterprise is one of the companies that has developed an incredible platform for visibility across all these. And they're working with... Um, with airports and, and, and a variety of different organizations to bring these three different disciplines together and provide that single pane of glass of visibility. That, that, that's the future, I think, in, in most organizations that have these different um, pieces of, of, of security. The top 20 critical controls. This started probably six or seven years ago. The SANS Institute um, brought a bunch of us together and said, what are the 20 most important things that companies should be thinking about? And, or actually, what are the most important things? And we came up with the top 20. And these, as you can see, they're not in any, they're not listed on this in any order. They're all over the place, but they fall in different buckets. But what we've been saying for the past five years is do the top four. If you do the top four, you can reduce your vulnerabilities by 75 to 80%. Well, the top four, Make sure you understand what hardware you have in your environment. Make sure you understand what software you have in your environment. Um, make sure your configurations, your patches are up to date in your environment. And make sure you have vulnerability management processes and software in your environment so you can identify things. If you can do those four things, you will, you can mitigate your risk 75 to 80%. Most companies don't do those four things really well. I could go to any one of your companies today and say, Give me an up-to-date inventory of all your hardware and software. And I promise you that nobody in the world can do that today. Things happen. There are things that were installed this morning that are not going to show up on that list. Um, so this is going to seem like an odd transition, but I'll explain. Has anybody seen this? This came out just two weeks ago. Um, California Data Breach Report. Um, and why is this significant for this group? Anybody do business in California, by the way? Few people? You should go read this. One of the first recommendations, any lawyers in the room? I know no one's going to raise their hand and admit it. Okay, one. Um, if you read this, I'm not an attorney, but... I'm gonna, I'll read it. So the 20 controls in the Center for Internet Security's critical security controls, that's the top 20 I just talked about, identify a minimum level of information security that all organizations that collect or maintain personal information should meet. 
the failure to implement all the controls that apply to an organization's environment constitute a lack of reasonable security. So this is from the California Attorney General. What this is saying to me is that if you have a, a data breach or a security incident, and in the course of an investigation, it's determined that you have not implemented all of these security controls, your company is negligent. And you get and deserve everything that comes along with that. I'm not saying I agree with that. I'm saying that's what I think this says. Um, so take this to your general counsel and let them read over and see what, th there's a bunch of recommendations. This is the first one that jumped out at me. I said, wow, nobody in the world that I know can implement all 20 of those controls. Um, and now the attorney general is saying that uh, it constitutes a lack of reasonable security. Whew. So the cloud, everybody's heard of the cloud, this nebulous thing out there that no one really understands because you can't put your arms around it, you can't touch it, you can't feel it. I think the cloud is probably the greatest catalyst for security that we've ever seen. Um, I gave a speech in 2009, and I said at the time, hey, we as security professionals, we need to be looking at this cloud thing because I think it's gonna be a big deal. Um, and after my talk, three or four of the CISOs in the room ran up. Um, I thought they had pitchforks in their hands. And they said, basically, over my dead body, will I put any of my organization's data in, out in this cloud and let somebody else manage it for me? Well, I was proven right, they were wrong. Because everybody has data in the cloud today. And Cisco just put out a report that said by um, 2019, 86% of all the data in the world today will exist in the cloud. There's a lot of reasons for that. But the primary reason is the economic advantages. I don't have to manage a data center anymore. I don't have to manage the infrastructure. I don't have to manage the people. The economic advantages are profound of, of being able to do this. And the companies that are, that are these cloud service providers, they are highly incentivized to provide security. It's not that the company doesn't want to or doesn't understand the security that they need to be implementing. They don't have the resources or the time to do it. These cloud security companies, they do. Now, I'm not saying they're perfect, and I'm not saying it's nirvana, and I'm not saying that you should put all of your data out in the cloud. I think there's always going to be a case to say there are certain crown jewels that we want to maintain control of. But most of your data is eventually going to end up in the cloud. And I think that's going to be a huge catalyst for all of our organizations to implement better security. Because security is going to come with it. So, to wrap up. Um, it, it, every, it, every big security breach you see today, there's a statement that's from the CEO that says, but it was a very sophisticated attack. And my position is, guess what? They're all sophisticated. Get over it. Um, that's no longer a good enough excuse. And every time I talk with a CEO, I don't say not every time, but most of the time when I talk to a CEO, um, the, the response I get, especially in small and medium-sized businesses, I didn't think were big enough, important enough, or valuable enough to be concerned about hackers. Guess what? Everybody is a target. Every one of us is a target. Um, and we need to be managing our organizations like we are a target. I know that sounds like a little bit of paranoia, and it is. Um, but every one of us needs to be, this is not something that's a byproduct of business now. This is part of every business today. So my final thought. Um, zero cyber risk is a mythology. I, hear, I still hear this every now and then. It says, we can implement enough, enough security controls that our risk goes to zero. I think this means that I'm done, or almost done. And I am almost done. Um, Know your assets, don't be Sony, have a, have a, a plan on how to deal with it. Um, cybersecurity is a journey, you know, I get this question from CEOs all the time and CFOs that says, hey, I gave these guys a million bucks last year, they're coming back for another million bucks this year. Hey, this is the cost of doing business in the world today. If you wanna be in the IT environment, you gotta spend money on security. So, thank you very much. I don't know, were we gonna take questions? Yes? Do we have time? Okay, we have time for questions.
No tomatoes. Rotten eggs. One question. Yes, sir. Think, think about what? Um, the, you mean the U.S. government you're talking about. So the question was, what do I think about the relinquishing of control of the Internet? Um, and the, what he's talking about is ICANN, the, I forget what the, the ICANN acronym stands for. ICANN was, has been, since the beginning of the Internet, responsible for the governance of the Internet. ICANN is a U.S.-based organization, has historically had a U.S. CEO. Um, last year they hired a CEO who is, I forget where he's from, but he's from somewhere in Europe. And, but basically the Obama administration has said, we are going to allow an international organization to become, to manage ICANN. Um, what do I think about it? Uh, I think the internet is America's gift to the world. You know, we built it. We manage 90% of it, more than 90% of it. Either, there are 13 domain controllers in the world that manage the flow of the internet, and 10 of them are physically in the United States. Um, but it's a global internet. So uh, I, I guess my personal opinion, I would like to see us continue to manage, manage it. And the reality is it's a global internet and I think it's probably the right thing to do. I'm not happy about it, but it's probably the right thing to do. Okay, I think I'm done. Thank you very much. <laughs>